Welcome to Accessibilities with Dr. Dean Marquis. Hi, I am Dr. D. Gennetti, and this is my co-host and service dog, Marquis. Marquis, high five. High five. Mm. Yeah, a boy. Marquis, say hi. <coughs> yeah, a boy. Today we're here with my special guest, Robert Oliveri. Today we're going to talk about um, part two of my story of recovery from TBI. Welcome, Robert. Morning, Doc D. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Very good. Nice to see you. So today's episode is part two of my story of recovery from traumatic brain injury. And I already said that. <laughs> um, this is an abbreviated account of my extensive recovery, even though it sounds a little bit long. My story reveals how events that pushed me beyond my perceived limits resulted in life-changing learning experiences revealing a process of first figuring out how to live, then making meaning of my struggle, and ultimately understanding who I am now. This journey has led to changes in my self-perception, changes in interpersonal relationships, and changes in my philosophy of life. I had to relearn cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal skills. I had to learn how to learn, how to heal, and have faith again. So, Doc D, it's nice to see you again. Last time we left off part one in on year four, right? Yes. So what has transpired or what did transpire from that point? So my ability to process information was greatly compromised. Long and short-term memory problems plagued me. Memory for retaining old knowledge and for sustaining new knowledge. I could only hold one idea or step in my brain at a time. I could no longer multitask. Louis Bennell wrote in his memoirs, you have to begin to lose your memory, if only in bits and pieces, to realize that memory is what makes our lives. Life without memory is no life at all. Our memory is our coherence, our reason, our feeling, even our action. Without it, we are nothing. I had more difficulty with reading, writing, and spelling to use these previously second nature com communication skills was comparable to learning a new language. I was learning that I was silenced both in communication skills and lack of medical knowledge, treatment, and research in order to heal. And the embarrassment of feeling like a different person and stigma associated with both TBI and PTSD added to my growing silence. My isolation expanded in this time span, I did things over and over and over, but each time it was new to me. I learned and I forgot strategies to help remember. I progressed to 30 minutes of uninterrupted work, trying to focus, concentrate, and catch myself if I wandered. I was learning strategies to pull myself back into awareness if I noticed I was off somewhere in my fog. Speaking of that, I remembered that you I uh, had mentioned that Rick had helped you with that cognition in, in fog. So what were your goals with him? So Rick's written goal for me was to relearn writing with the following objectives. To be able to write in full thoughts and sentences, stay focused on the paragraph, and be able to decipher the main and supportive sentences, both in writing and reading comprehension. Rick provided me slowly with education, particularly pertaining to traumatic brain injury, in order to understand some of my confusing and exasperating symptoms. Showing me how to put my feelings into words, he taught me to make an action plan, which I called a Rick list. I had many Rick lists. Rick became my life coach. He helped me to try to organize my every task by showing me how to master undertakings or at least gain new knowledge for that which no longer came naturally. We set up structures and systems for dealing with time and life sol solving problems. Rick was instrumental in helping me develop self-worth and to shed the shame and stigmatization I felt to my core. Even with an undefined identity, I had kept my strong aspiration and sense of urgency to get my intelligent me back. Through cognitive and metacognitive skills training, I learned how to turn words into fragments and then into sentences. I worked with Rick on thinking in complete thoughts. I read short three sentence stories and learned to take notes, which came out to be cryptic. They were in bulleted 
points with just a few words. And as it turned out, when I read them back, there were not enough words to flesh out the bulleted points into a meaningful idea. I also listened to short news stories on NPR on the web, beginning with two to three minutes at a time, but was unable to answer any questions about the content. Besides reading and writing, Rick helped me with relearning strategies for activities of daily living. Strategies for taking care of my home, making a plan for paying bills using a calendar, several ways of making a shop, shopping list, which were all unsuccessful, mm -hmm. microwave cooking steps for heating up food, contacting the bank to set up online banking, and then checking it. This sounded great for organi for, and organized for these necessary activities, but took several years to set up and reset up to put into memory and practice to follow, even with the assistance of others at my home. My self-concept was diminishing, though. I felt so unindividualistic and lonely. I felt like no one understood me and the magnitude of my losses and what I was trying to overcome. So you went through a lot of changes, and how did you adjust uh, to your changed lifestyle? I was still not able to speak or write what I was trying to think and convey. Speech generating devices were recommended. My memory impairments of negatively affected my ability to functionally use a speech recognition processor. Working with my assistive technology therapist, I had days of getting it and then losing it, working with Dragon Naturally Speaking. We worked to regain my thoughts, capture ideas, and be able to hold on to words long enough to say a whole thought. I improved my memory, fluency, and learned note-taking and technology improvement capabilities with voluminous needed breaks and perseverance. This was very difficult. In this stage, I rationally ascertained that I would be back to writing my dissertation and consequently get my old life back in the very near future. I was mortified one minute at my lack of and slow progress and then calm and vague the next in my nothingness fog. Rick introduced me to the book Over My Head, a doctor's own story of head injury from the inside looking out by Claudia Osborne. It was a tool for learning reading comprehension and writing, as well as an introduction into the culture of TBI. I used my notes and reflections I kept while reading the book. Claudia and I shared an incredible bond of feeling and knowing what nobody else could know uh, without a brain injury, that of knowing from the inside looking out. It took me a year and a half to read this small paperback book of 232 pages with chapters of 10 pages each. Claudia was a doctor of internal medicine and taught med students at the university. I was getting to know Claudia as a person who really was a fellow traveler. Claudia and I both had adynamia, a neurologically based lack of vigor, spontaneity, and or animation. I had a very monotone voice. It was gratifying and relieving to hear Claudia articulate my daily thoughts, concerns, and happenings it was also reassuring to hear the not so great symptomatology. Somebody else knew my pain and suffering and understood my fervent hope and adamant position that I would be back to my doctoral studies and trauma clients as she wanted the same. As Claudia fought willfully to get back to doctoring, I believed in her tenacity and hard work and that the undertaking of this awe-inspiring book would unquestionably conclude with her comeback to her old life. Claudia wanted, as I did, how she can continue to exist as an unrecognizable, undesirable being living with a deficient brain. Bearable were her faded brain injuries because they were temporary. We both used props, which included post-it notes, timers and alarms, tape cassettes, lists and notebooks for memory compensation. So Claudia attended an outpatient top rehab program for TBI in New York with a cohort of 10 other TBI survivors. They were role models for me. They all voiced their dismay about a life not their own and were lost after TBI, having to find a new identity. In me, I discovered a non-competent person trying to perform my life and not doing it very well. 
Claudia stated, I was not this damaged shell of a person. I couldn't be. I remembered and loved the person I was. That was the real me. I felt the same. I did find out that Claudia did not get back to doctoring, which was devastating to me. For my journal, I wrote, I am devastated. I do not think I can drop or change my life to embrace another, not again. I have been there, done that, after my first car crash. It took lots and lots of energy, courage, soul searching, letting go and rebuilding to make my life worthwhile. I do not believe I have it in me again. I work hard to recover. It is exhausting. Now I am trying to find where I fit and find what I have to use or give. So Dr. D, after going through all of that, which is remarkable, what was your progress uh, at that time? So in this time frame, my health insurance decided that I was not making enough progress fast enough and ended my speech language cognitive therapy. I stayed on through private payment as this therapy was crucial to my recovery. The number of sessions dropped drastically, which was devastating to me. Mm. I firmly knew that this therapy organized my life, helped me to think and understand, and was my primary hope for returning to optimum cognitive functioning. Out of sheer necessity, I managed to pay privately as my life literally depended on these sessions. My sessions became once every two weeks, then three weeks for financial reasons instead of twice a week, which was mm. very disorganizing. I felt increasingly depressed and hopeless. What type of an impact did this have on your recovery, would you say? Um, I became a bit <laughs> stuck in therapy with Rick. So he referred me for a neurological, neuropsychological evaluation to see where I was at. Dr. Jacob was giving me the test that usually takes one day, um, and he stopped the testing and broke it up into three separate days, saying it was due to extreme fatigue, which would not allow her to continue at her brightest. Word retrieval and intellectual stamina were, were the biggest impediments. So when I completed the exam, Dr. Jacob reported that I present with severe cognitive impairments that are of sufficient magnitude to warrant concern about her safety to perform household activities like cooking and have dramatically decreased functional status. Profound impairment of attentional function which with rapid cognitive fatigue, distractibility and severe impairment of sustained and selective attention, variability across tasks of executive functioning with intact novel reasoning ability, but severe impairment of time thought generation and cognitive flexibility. Also, language impairments with reduced verbal fluency, word retrieval deficits, and difficulty with high-level language organization and verbal expression. A severe attentionally based memory impairment with reduced acquisition and retrieval of information and poor performance on recognition tasks. Beyond the cognitive assessment, from a psychological perspective, Ms. Gennetti is also currently struggling with symptoms of depression and PTSD. He wrote, at the current time, it is extremely difficult to imagine that she would be able to handle academic tasks. Her decreased attention capacity, rapid fatigue, reduced memory, and overall level of behavioral disorganization are of sufficient magnitude that they are resulting in impairments of independent activities of daily living, which are far less demanding than the rigors of data analysis and academic writing. Unless there is significant improvement in her cognitive status and endurance, it is also extremely difficult to imagine her participation in continued professional activities. Do you feel that this had an impact on your sense of self-worth? I developed an impaired and ve very negative sense of myself. I had worthlessness. Feelings of depression as well as fear and dread alternated inside me. Everything felt like an effort. I had to make an effort just to make an effort. I got easily agitated and irritated. Crying happened easily with, without an apparent cause. This is emotionality that I didn't have pre-TBI. This led to more feelings of discouragement, sometimes, whoops, 
and causing me to withdraw more into social isolation. My slowed speech, sometimes total blink for a minute or two, or saying something off topic caused a majority of people to ignore me and look above my head and finish talking with, the, with whomever was with me, as though I was not there, including family. No one seemed to be patient enough or willing to wait to understand. Shockingly, I found out my traditionally high IQ tested <coughs> as borderline intelligence. This was distressing, as it certainly did not project the needs and ability to learn scholarly writing and finish my dissertation. This news was shaming on one hand, but non-comprehensible on the other. To my psychotherapist, I said, I'm not me anymore. More and more of me is slipping away every day. I can't find me. What did you do to address these feelings? So we, you know, the self-worth aspect. Yeah. So my doctor found a, uh, another doctor who specialized in TBI and PTSD, which at the time was very difficult to find. I went inpatient for more intensive rehabilitation. My care included physical, language, and cognitive therapies, occupational therapy, lots of training and coping skills, and pharmacology for PTSD and depression, including medications. Um, I was given Aricept for memory, which was being used in Alzheimer's patients at that time. My occupational therapist there shockingly told me straight out and boldly, in words that I had not heard, you are judging yourself too harshly from where you used to be. You were a different person, one that you will never be again. He went on, it's time to give up the old you. He told me he would not allow me to speak about, about the old me and specifically named my work, schooling, counseling, committees, and anything that used to define who I was. He told me to develop new interests and meet people who know my brain now and have nothing to compare it to. My biggest fear in the moment was that I would now lose all of me. So much had vanished. I did not want to grieve and find new interests. I liked my old interests passionately, even though I could not keep up. After a month in rehab, Rick's first note back stated, patient remains tangent tangentially mildly verbose with significant downed working memory. Patient loses train of thought several times. Needs cue to verbalize as memory placeholder. Overall, markedly less agitation and also improved attention and memory, yet the cognitive areas remain crippling. So what year were you at at this point in your recovery? So, um, so now we'll move on to years five and six. That was my next segment that I talk about. So in year five post-DBI, I became more aware of the breadth of my shattered self. Wait, my key. I had not been able to maintain a sense of identity, any identity. My sense of good was crushed. How could this have happened? Can I ever be repaired? Now that this has happened, how can I do any good in the world? How can I be restored to wholeness? How can certain or any fairness happen in, in the world, in my world? Are we destined to be victims of external events, to lose our sense of freedom over our destiny, to wallow in anger, fear, and anxiety? With a longer independent focus <coughs> ability of about one hour in this fifth year, even though my abstract reasoning was quite dis decreased, I could focus on my perceptions, beliefs, and beliefs which were changed to my very core. I was, however, able to realize that certain likelihoods in my life will never become possibilities, and I began to look for ways in which to reconfigure my goals. I was finding out that those who try to put their lives back as they were remain fractured and vulnerable, but those who accept the breakage and build themselves anew become more resilient and open to new ways of living. I was smack in the middle of those two frames. I had lost my faith in my abilities and in God. Why did this happen to me? Will I be normal again? Is there life? Is life worth living after brain injury? This continued my albeit slow quest for meaning. So in year five for my journal, I wrote, 
After blindly sitting on the edge of the road in my fog for so many years, I was able to finally roll out a bit and see down the road. Not the end of the road, but a new one in the clearing that is yet unpaved. It is a long road journey, but I am doing it with God right by my side, and at moments, like footprints in the sand, he's carried me when I felt I could not go on. I had a deepening of my spiritual spirituality, allowing for areas of Angela's mysteries. I also could now see possibilities that I did not want to see before. I wanted my old possibilities back. I believed God has a path for us, but I altered my belief system to include that random acts happen and bad things happen to good people. My revised belief includes that the God I believe in would not have me go through such another major challenge of grief and pain and struggle for any reason. I believe God gives us the inner strength to reach for and the courage to accept that which has happened so that we can move on down our paths that take twists and turns. God's love helps bring us out of the darkness and gives us hope in the midst of despair. And I came to realize that we cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. Okay. So with that, Dee, I'd like to ask, lead on with that. Now that you've adjusted your sails, what direction are you traveling? Or where are you traveling next? Um, so uh, next, I had a remarkable doctoral committee at, at Lesley University where I was obtaining my PhD. Uh, they were fabulous women who showed great faith in me as they stayed in touch with me even through my leave of absence. They believed in me and encouraged me as I struggled to continue to write. They met with me periodically and gave me small writing assignments during my leave of absence. They supported me even when I did not make sense, hmm. acknowledging that I may not be able to return to my doctoral program, but they were still there for me. A written memo I wrote was reviewed by my committee in this fifth year, along with a lot of other considerations. My extraordinary doctoral committee felt I was ready to start writing my thesis domains to continue as my focus evolved. My focus for my program shifted to the polytraumas of TBI and PTSD, as well as post-traumatic growth and disability culture. I was accepted back into my program from my leave of absence of almost six years. Mm. At this time, I also continued to write in my exercises with Rick and do other cognitive work for comprehending, verbalizing, and attending to material in the context of my professional endeavors, like listening to and taking notes as though at a conference, performing research, and learning and understanding research methods and materials. As a reasonable accommodation for some of my TBI deficits, I began working with Daniel at Lesley University, another exceptional individual I was blessed with who tutored me in academic support. We met by phone weekly and every now and then in person, reviewing my dissertation structure, organizing, and brainstorming concepts together. Recovery is remarkably amazing. Where were you in your recovery at this point, would you say? In my sixth year, post-TBI, I continued to work my, with my psychotherapist, working on my shattered assumptions, ambivalence, rumination, reflective pondering, and rebuilding of my new self. I went to assistive technology. I saw Rick every two to three weeks. I saw Dr. Bob, my PCP, every three to four weeks, as he still followed my progress closely. He was another dear person I was blessed with as he committed to not letting me fall through the cracks. He has been a pillar of strength, encouragement, and forward direction for me. I also saw my P TBI PTSD doctor every three works. We <laughs> <laughs> every three weeks, I continued physical therapy for my second rotator cuff surgery. I began to connect socially through a survivor support group and a writing group with other doctoral students. With Rick, I started trying to verbalize what he called an elevator speech of my dissertation. And that is a short, concise, complete synopsis that can be stated in the short span of an elevator ride. Condensing any subject into a small amount of words was very difficult for me. 
I was actually quite verbose. I also did not have it formulated well in my head, in part because it was still developing. In order to help me in this process, Rick invited me to speak on a panel of TBI survivors at Boston University, which was the next step in my rehabilitation. It became a regular endeavor once a semester. I had to order my experience in the sequence that events occurred. I related to the students and with other, the other panelists, there were usually four people on a piano, who were all just like me in their need to develop and use compensatory strategies to accomplish everyday tasks due to their brain injuries. And they worked. What a relief and sensation of camaraderie to meet similar others and not have to walk, explain ourselves to each other. We already knew, we understood. From my journal I wrote, I am hearing firsthand stories of brain injury and their recovery paths. It is awesome to meet other people like myself in a new community where I finally feel I belong. They are all fairly functional. I have not met other high functioning TBI survivors. Functional levels are widely varied with TBI survivors. No two brain injuries are alike. It is exciting, but a bit disconcerting as I am face to face with mortality, seeing the truth of the possibility that I might not recover to my definition of what recovery means. I felt that I received even more than I gave in the presentations, which were terrible in the beginning. I was becoming more grounded and less disconnected. There was such a wide variety of everlasting symptoms and disabilities to deal with, another way of life. Over this period of time, I saw others manage and endure daily activities in spite of their TBI changes and challenges. It was a new way of life, and how one lives it is up to our own selves. I was beginning to embrace me for who I am now, although I still did not embrace having the TBI. My recovery still had a long way to go for me to consider myself productive or even a viable member of society again, but I experienced a measurable shift. I did. And where did you go from here? Okay, so now we're into years seven and eight of my, my recovery. My memory loss continued to lead a huge change in my everyday life, especially for communication and understanding. It was also hard to hold information <clears throat> in my brain and try to manipulate it. I came up with a brilliant idea to externalize my thoughts. I wrote my thoughts on post-it notes and made a graph system on large eight by 10 cork boards. There I could manipulate my thoughts for my research and move them into columns so I could analyze and interpret them. I lined an entire bedroom with these boards and thoughts. Mm. Then year seven post TBI was stimulating for me. I found it easier to reflect and interpret in spite of my traumatic brain injury. A special note was that a new medication for cognition was now available specifically for memory. Most prominent trials had been done with people with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. In March, I started taking the new medication, Namenda, in conjunction with Aricep twice a day. It helped immensely. My memory was stronger. I had better focus and concentration for longer periods of time. My memory capacity increased. My attention and retention noticeably grew so much that my doctor doubled the dose in June. For my journal in August, I wrote, I have been clearer in my writing and what I want to say. I feel more direct rather than dancing around a subject. I hold several thoughts and try to manipulate them. I feel like I am breaking out of captivity. It is not a wonder drug, taken with my other medication and still working hard at my skills and strategies. I am making positive strides. I can think a bit more again, for far more than my dark cloak and spacey days, which I still have occasionally. Things are looking up. I still have to pace myself and follow my other brain strategies. So I also developed insight at this time. So again, from my journal, I wrote, I will never be the same, but I am learning to live with the me now and strive for the best. I have a new normal. It is a combination of actually getting better, 
how it, forgetting how it used to be and adapting to changes around me and how I now do things. I stopped doing certain things because it was just not possible or was not that important for me to spend that much energy on. So my cognitive capabilities were improving through the process of writing. I started practicing self-reflection. I could hold multiple thoughts in a step. I was learning to think critically again, albeit slowly. I got my passion for my work again and finally felt ready to be back to my doctoral work and dissertation. Rick stated his observation of tremendous growth in me to the point where he believed I could take on the rigors of academia with support. His opinion was paramount to me as he had been conservative with his opinion regarding my ability. Mm, amazing. So your ability to think seems to be expanding greatly at this point. Yes, in this eighth year, post TBR, from my journal I wrote, I am working in two hour sprints through the day and night, seven days a week. It takes an enormous amount of effort and I know what I want to write. It takes an enormous amount of effort after I know what I want to write to actually formulate and write each sentence. I literally fall asleep after each two hour writing period time. Mm -hmm. Also from my journal I wrote, I am developing wisdom. I finally, I am finding what is changeable and what is not by circumstances and acceptance. I have an awareness that I am ready to face new possibilities. I do not feel I am able to do better things with my life, but I feel now that I am better able to do things in and with my life post-trauma. I will never have my life back as I knew it. No one can. And that is okay. Healing doesn't mean the damage never existed. It means the damage no longer controls our lives. So during an office visit with my TBI PTSD specialist, he informed me that I was a su success story and a role model. Nice. Nobody pred could predict that I would actually get back to doing my dissertation. So the reasons he cited for my, continu were for my continued recovery from TBI and PTSD um, and my progress and tenacity on my dissertation, which I was writing daily. I was doing analysis and interpretation, a huge accomplishment for my brain. Dr. T credited my success as well for participation and success on the speaker panel at Boston University, which was more fluent this eighth year. He had me take a moment to reflect upon where I was and from where I had come. We estimated I was, I was only about 65% of what I used to be, and that turned out to be the best that I can be now. During this eighth year in 2015, <clears throat> at the suggestion of my doctoral committee, I tried to flex my brain capacity by taking a writing course at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education. I was terrified and didn't feel worthy to be there. I was writing, but was I really a writer again? Not knowing my circumstances, I was accepted for who I was now. I gained a feeling of mounting control over more than writing a sentence, but also control for over the shape texture and energy of a sentence. I became inspired. I gained knowledge for concentrating on ways to frame my memories, tighten focus, and clarify feelings and opinions. I actually had to think and formulate opinions, which was still a sluggish process for me. My dissertation writing was budding. I took another course entitled Living Stories. It was a workshop for beginner and advanced writers. My writing with my writing and flow were enhanced. I learned more of the texture of the story and where I was in relation to what I was writing. Writing creatively and on different subject matters sparked new life and ideas into my dissertation writing. In this eighth year post-TBI, I found I was on a steady path. I had a daily life with happenings beyond survival and trying to write a sentence. I was able to present what I had been doing over the past three weeks which Rick helps me organize and to enunciate what I want to work on in the day's session. I took more control over the sessions rather than having Rick lead. 
I took another course in covered, in, entitled The Poetry of Grief and Trauma Advanced Poetry Workshop. I found I was able to explore difficult subject matter in poetry without the risk of drowning in it. Writing a poem to me was a way to assemble a little bit of order in the midst of chaos. My expressiveness was dramatically improved and my recovery boosted. In this course, I explored my circumstances through different forms of poetry. In August of that year, I wrote a lengthy poem called The Taken about TBI. I'm going to read the last stanza because the poem is too long. What did I give you? You gave me angst. You gave me hopelessness. You gave me fatigue. You gave me loneliness. But my endurance and will held strong, turned into new self-perception, turned into new relationships, turned into a new philosophy of life. I give me growth after all that has been taken. So my th final thought with my dissertation is that beautiful life is not always produced in ideal conditions. I liken my recovery journey to a lotus flower, rising through mud and adversity, petals opening one by one, and ultimately blossoming in the sun. So I want to let you know that Marquis and I did graduate with our PhD in 2019. This is my dissertation which is entitled An Autoethnographic Inquiry of Identity Transformation in Post-Traumatic Growth Following Traumatic Brain Injury and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. It's 396 pages long. Congratulations. So thank you, Robert, for helping me share my story. And I want to thank you for watching our show. And I want to remind you that you can watch us on WCTV.org Video On Demand Comcast Channel 99, Verizon Channel 39, Sundays at 6, and also on YouTube by searching for Access Abilities. See the Statue of Liberty icon um, seated in a wheelchair, and you'll see the episodes there. We're also on Facebook.com reverse slash Access Abilities 2020. So thank you. My key up. My key, say bye. <laughs> bye. Say bye. Oh, oh. Good job. Good boy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs>